Welcome everyone to a brand new video and podcast series, Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. We're here to keep you up to date with the latest tech news, reviews, content, and wisdom from the world of marketing. My co-host is a man on a mission to keep marketing simple. He is the voice of the Marketing and Finance Podcast. He is also the host of the Roger Log video series. I give you Mr. Roger Edwards. Hello, Pascal. Thank you so much for that introduction. You know, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. You are also on a mission to demystify digital marketing. You're the host of the Content Marketing Studio and, and other podcasts as well. And you are my good friend, Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you very much for the introductions. I can't wait to hear what we have to say today. Um, <laughs> we are on missions and we like challenges. So this video podcast it's a bit of a challenge for you and I from a production point of view, but also just to find new ways to create content, to engage an audience and learn in the process. Absolutely right. And we've got lots of segments to talk about. The news, technology, film marketing. And, uh, you know, I've been spending quite a lot of time this week, as of you, trawling our sources, trawling the internet, looking for interesting stories to talk about. And I think we've spotted quite a few. Indeed. So shall we begin with In The News? Okay, Roger, I've got something for you. Content curation is the new black, with all platforms making it much easier, from Twitter promoting their list, from Google opening collections, Facebook launching their collections, and YouTube playlist becoming the thing. You know, Twitter are also testing audio tweets question I have is this is this the arrival of micro podcasting Roger I know you like video games and playing online you perhaps on the live streamer but you know that Microsoft actually is going to shut down Mixer in July their competitor to Twitch they're going to partner up with Facebook gaming and they're going to transfer 70,000 live streamers and the 10 million live audiences this is not going well does this include me as a, a recently converted Fortnite gamer? Probably does. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Apple have officially confirmed that it will be moving away from Intel processors in Mac computer to its own custom-made chips. Amazon is launching a support program in partnership with Enterprise Nation. They are looking to help for free 200,000 small business owners. Alibaba is recruiting an army of live streamers for its e-commerce platform, whilst the Chinese government is trying to clamp down on live streaming in its territory. There are winners and losers sorry, during this uh, global crisis. Losers include big names like Google, who are predicting to have, for the first time in 10 years, a big decline on the, in their ad revenue. Winners include platforms like Shopify. And finally... A study by Brandmaker found that half of marketers surveyed, surveyed were able to adapt swiftly thanks to previous investments in digital tools, in particular online collaboration. Okay, thanks. Well done, Roger. Some really nice finds. Can I just say that the one about Twitter and micro-podcasting is the one that just caught my eyes and ears, literally? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you make of this? Well... Pascal, when I found out about this, I went straight to my Twitter app and opened it up and was um, disappointed to find that I didn't actually have this. But uh, I actually manage a couple of uh, Twitter accounts for um, clients, and I found that one of my clients actually did have it. So I dived in and had a look. I quite like the way they've done it because you speak into the into the phone and it almost creates like a videogram. It, it makes your image pulsate to the, t the tone of your voice. Um, so I was initially quite impressed with it and I thought that it did stand out in the timeline. But the one big problem for me is that it's not there's no captions on it. Mm. So not only is it going to be difficult for hard of hearing people to actually hear what's being said, but I, I think they've missed a trick because the, if they'd actually captioned it, I think it would have stood out more. Well, let's hope that that's the next stage, stage of evolution for them because you're right. Otherwise, my reaction was to be pleased to see a new feature. I remembered actually that they did suggest that they may get into podcasting themselves uh, a few months ago. This is not, I think, the vision that they had. But with that captioning, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, Roger, surely they have the wealth and the connection to partner up with um, the right kind of app developers and get this done as uh, you, you and I know we can do on video. But my reaction was, well, why not just do a video message? 
I, mm. I mean, I just, I was a bit kind of uh, like you, delighted to see a new feature, and then immediately kind of a little, uh, well, I'm not sure about it. I mean, I saw yours and our good friend, Mr. Ask Asquith, you know, who's done the, um, the test, and it sounds great, and I love, you know, like you said, the, the icon with the, the kind of sound wave pulsating is very elegant. But you're right, without the captioning, it just feels, I mean, someone could misunderstand this to be just an image. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. that you have to press play on it. I was thinking back, actually. Anchor tried to launch an entire platform probably about three years ago, which was all based around effectively audio tweets, if you like. And and they didn't really succeed in that endeavor. They They effectively had to pivot to become a full podcasting platform. But I guess what I'm thinking about here is it's just another type of tweet. So you could do an audio tweet, you can do a text tweet, you can do a video tweet, a picture tweet. It gives you the variety to put out different types of content. And for that reason, it might actually work. But I still think captions are important. Yeah, so we wish them well. Uh, I will, as soon as it's available to Android uh, you know, phone users, I will certainly give it a go. I think it would be a wonderful way to maybe do a teaser content for a blog post or you need, you need a podcast. Even I'm thinking more maybe direct messaging because that's what we're used to. This audio message is available, as you know, on LinkedIn now, LinkedIn Message, Messenger, uh, from the Facebook ecosystem as well as WhatsApp. So I'm thinking maybe that's where it's going to grow, which is more the one-to-one, one-to-few as opposed to a big public announcement. Well, that's interesting news and, and all the others were, but we need to move on to something. We're going to slow things down a little, Roger, with um, content spotlights. Roger, what is your content spotlight of the week? Okay, this is an article, Pascal, that appeared in Marketing Week a few weeks ago. It's by uh, an author called Mark Ritson. Now, if anybody knows Mark Ritson, they may actually have a preconceived opinion of this guy. He used to be a marketing professor. He's very outspoken. He swears quite a lot in his articles, so he's a little bit Marmite, or because he actually lives in Australia, he's probably a little bit Vegemite. But I actually quite like a lot of the things that he says, and, and, and this is actually quite a worrying article because he's actually looking at boardrooms across the world, you know, C-suites, I guess they call them um, in some countries, and more and more companies are not having marketing people on their boards. And he sort of points the reason for this might be that in the digital age, the responsibility of the marketer has become less strategic. Now, you and I, obviously, we're a little bit older, and We've been around the block a few times. Now, when we were trained as marketers, when we did the academic stuff, marketing was all about research. It was all about understanding customer needs. It was about developing products. And it was about working out how much to charge for those products. And then once you've done all of that and you've got something to talk about, you then go into promotion mode. And that's where you start doing advertising and content and all of that sort of thing. But for a lot of marketers these days, their role has almost shrunk down just to that promotional part and with digital marketing you know a digital marketing person is really in a lot of cases just a digital marketing communicator and that's it they don't do the research they don't do the product development they don't do the pricing and, and Mark's contention is that the marketing profession is at risk of being devalued because marketers aren't involved in all that strategic stuff anymore quite contentious I think and very disappointing to hear because I would argue with you, Roger, that it has taken decades for marketers to have a seat at the boardroom table. And I, what I can say, what I'm hearing from you, and I have evidence to suggest that that's the case in the UK, they are losing their seat. And the reason for that is that the role of marketers, and, and I think the industry as a whole has, has a role to play to remedy that, is become someone with a bag of tricks and hacks and and shortcuts and, and that kind of things. And as a result of it, they've been once again demoted to just that kind of uh, lower level uh, thinkers and doers. 
And and that really, really pains me to hear because as someone that's been involved, as you said, for several decades, it took us, you and I, communicators and, and, and marketers, a very long time to earn that seat at the boardroom table. And we are losing it almost with no fault of our own beyond the fact that if you're not careful and someone was to just look into it by Googling, it gives the impression from the blog posts and the, the, the videos and the podcast that the way to do marketing digital age is to do tricks. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, Mark describes some marketing departments as the colouring in department. Now, that that's actually quite derogatory. And, you know, it, it's up to all of us as marketers to elevate the profession back uh, into the, into that strategic role. But there are there, there are there are crumbs of comfort. There was also an article in Marketing Week recently which suggested that Sainsbury's, you know, our, our big supermarket here in the UK, has finally reappointed a marketing person to the board. So that's a good sign. It is, and, and let's hope that all those will follow follow through. But um, it is worrying because, um, like I said, for me, um, the function of, of marketing it's, it's, is, is very rich and very diverse. It's not just limited to the world of digital. It's, you know, I mean, the, the list can, can be very long, but from consumer, customer insights, all the way to intelligence now, obviously, it would be the number one discipline to be, make full use of AI, as well as other form of uh, automation for, for good. And, and also, if you think about it, um, now, whilst you and I um, perhaps unwisely are launching this new video podcast during a pandemic and the hottest in a month of the year, <laughs> we, we th- this this is a creating an environment where communication and showing up obviously the r- real human side of the organisation is becoming very important. And you've got to turn to the communicators and and those you understand kind of the human psyche for that. So let's let's just hope that it's just a blip. And that marketers will continue to retain, if not reclaim, their spot in the in the boardroom. Absolutely right. That's my that's my sincere hope as well. So, um, Pascal, creating commodity content isn't just ineffective marketing; it's dangerous. That's the title of the article you've brought to the table this week. Indeed. And what is interesting for our viewers and listeners, we don't talk to each other on purpose. We play the game. You find your content spotlight and I find mine. And we just see remarkable that the two complement each other because a moment ago I said to you, let's be very careful that our profession, which I really adore and we spend decades obviously uh, learning and improving, is not just summarized as someone with a bag of tricks. And this article that was written by Molly Donovan, now Molly Donovan is part of the team who has launched, I think, a new program or a new business called Show Runners. The founder is Jay Okunzo. Now, for some of um, our viewers and listeners again, Jay Okunzo will be known as one of the voices of reason when it comes to content marketing done properly and so on and so forth. And he's got an amazing track record. And the this is a long form article which I tend to always be attracted to. I like the idea of people actually going in depth, and and in fact, it's true to what they're talking about. So what they say is that commodity content is that very disposable content that was created purely to drive traffic and to get the clicks. And the challenge and the issue with commodity content, which is often what people do implicitly, uh, I suggest to you that it's to do with keyword research being the only reason people do content nowadays. What uh, Molly is arguing, supporting Jay's position, is that that commodity content is forgettable and in, in a way replaceable. That is to say the visitor or the consumer will forget immediately where they got that from and it will not lead to a long uh, relationship based on trust and, and empathy. So they are warning, and I think it's part of their manifesto as part of showrunners, showrunners being this program business helping people find their voice through through podcasts. And what they're saying is, your job really is to find your own unique way to answer that question. But if you answer the question in a, very, in a way that is very superficial, or the same way as everybody else, you know, using your own tone of voice, you're, you're, you're going to lead to disappointment. And for me, the way that I do, Roger, one concern that I have for my customers is burnout. And I do believe that commodity content, commodity content is actually at the heart of many burnout. People, you know, they, they go into this massive kind of hamster wheel way of doing content, video podcasting and so on. There's a phrase in that article that I wanted to share with you, Roger, and get your reaction, which is as follows. They, your customers, don't want you to be Google. They want you to be you. 
And every time you choose not to be you, that disappointment grows. Yeah, yeah. I agree with this. I mean, there is so much stuff out there content-wise. I mean, it's not just content, is it? We're bombarded every day with emails, with adverts. You know, every time you open up a website these days, especially media websites, you know, you've got pop-up videos and this, that, and the other vying for your attention. But you've got to stand out. And we're all unique. You're unique. I'm unique. We all have our own individual personalities and, and values. And I think that let's not conform to the norm. Let's not try to do it like everybody else. Find your own voice and, and be different. Stand out. You know, Be a little bit controversial um, if you need to and, and, and take a stand with what you're saying. But if all you're doing is, is churning out stuff that's just like everybody else's, then it's just not going to rise to the top. So we're back then to your earlier comment about the marketers at the boardroom table because that, that it starts from leadership, doesn't it? If mm -hmm. you are, uh, forgive me, you know, someone who is a subordinate and you, your function is to create the content, but you need your leaders to share with you their vision, the tone of voice, the, the, where, where they stand. I mean, you talk about being controversial. Sometimes it's simply because that's what you firmly believe in. Mm -hmm. And you want to find a way to express that. And I think at the moment, what is happening far too much, but again, this pandemic is giving people a platform to be actually more themselves, is, well, let's do the keyword research. This is the question people ask. And let's find a very safe way to answer this question. And they end up with this kind of very banal and, and kind of, well, tell me something I don't know already. I remember recently I was attracted. I fell for a clickbait, you know, uh, title. <laughs> Five ways in which you can make your social media better from entrepreneurs.com to name the source. And I thought, actually, I was, I'm always keen to learn something, Roger. I never assume that, you know, we know everything. So I thought, let me find out. And it was the shortest and the most superficial article ever written about how to do better on social media. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. this is what's wrong at this moment in time. People are just busy doing units of content as opposed to maybe going very deep or actually going very diverse. So to your point earlier, why don't you explore that one question in multiple different ways? From an article to a video with a, with a guest to a podcast with a panel discussion. But at least what you end up with, Roger, is this idea of that one question that you all have, we have taken the trouble to explore it thoroughly in different ways and in the process actually discovered your own voice. So I've turned, I've turned to now turn away from short form content, perhaps obviously often wrongly, but I just feel that this is part of the problem right now, which is this content kind of content churn, which leads to burnout internally and disappointment for the customers. Yeah, absolutely. I think in business, it's not enough to be the same as somebody else, the same in terms of content, probably the same in terms of product. It's not often enough to be better because the problem with better is that you're only best until somebody is better than you. And let's face it, you could start off, you know, I launch a product with um, two widgets and then next week, a competitor launches something with three widgets, so they're better than me. So I launch something with four widgets, so I'm better than them. That's a that's a game that will carry on. The way to win is to do something different. So ask yourself this question. What can I do with my content that's different to everybody else's? And I'm not saying that's easy, Pascal. It isn't easy. But different is the way to be stand out. Roger, this is our next segment, Marketing, Tech and Apps. I know that you and I need to spend a bit of time on this, not too long, but um, do you have maybe a couple you'd like to share with us this week? Yeah, first one, first one is called, and it's got a great name, I love this, it's called Voice Meter Banana. Now, there is actually a, a more advanced version, which is called Voice Meter Potato, so they've, they've obviously got a fruit and vegetable thing going on here, but we'll, I'll, I'll just stick with Voice Meter Banana today. Now, actually, this is related to podcasting, Pascal. Um, I've done 200, nearly 250 episodes of my own podcast, the Marketing and Finance Podcast, which you kindly mentioned in the introduction, but recently I've been having dreadful trouble getting the audio right and most of my podcasts are interviews so I have people on Zoom or on Skype and 
I've had to cancel a few interviews recently because the, the audio has just been dreadful. And I, I looked at Zoom. Is Zoom having a problem because of the uh, the fact that everybody in the world is using Zoom during the COVID lockdown? Is there a problem with Skype? And after quite a lot of messing around, I worked out that it was actually my mixer, my Alesis mixer. It's a, it's a actual physical unit with hundreds of knobs on it has just packed in. And uh, a lot of, um, I went onto Amazon, is there an alternative? Quite a lot of the equivalents have sold out. Some of them are very expensive. And I came across Voice Meter Banana. And it's a virtual mixing desk. You download it onto your PC. Obviously, it it looks on screen a little bit like the physical product. So there are sliders and knobs and that sort of thing. But it does everything that a physical mixer can do but actually on your desktop. And it almost has vir- uh, virtual cables. So you can plug your microphone in, you can plug your um, Skype in, your Zoom in, and then you can output it um, so that to Audacity or to Adobe Audition or something like that. So all of a sudden, I've gone from having this great big clunky plastic thing with lots of knobs and sliders on to this very compact little thing on my desktop and the sound is fantastic. I'm a very happy man. And apparently you, it's you been sounded, around for Roger. Many... You sounded. <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's been around for many years. It's but you know, it's it always takes a crisis like a piece of equipment packing in like my mixer did for me to actually go out there and source something as uh, useful as this. So yeah, voice me to banana. Somehow you've summarized, you know, the last three months for most of us. You it takes a crisis to find a better <laughs> solution. And I think for all the businesses around the world who have had to embrace digital more, uh, it kind of feels like it. Ryan, yeah. well, I'm, I'm not sure whether your next um, suggestion is going to be able to uh, outdo this one, but let's see. What have you got? This sort of goes back a little bit as well to what we were talking about, the um, Twitter audio tweets. Now, there's a fabulous app from Apple. It's called Apple Clips. It's, a, it's effectively a, a video recording uh, app that you have on your phone. And it's been out again. It's been out for about three years. But the remarkable thing about Apple Clips, and this is why I love it so much, is that you can hold it up, you can take video, you can take selfie video, and as soon as you press record, it instantaneously generates captions on the screen as you speak. And it's remarkably accurate. It really is remarkably accurate. And it deals with my Northern English accent perfectly. Um Yes, you can go in and you can edit it. It does make the odd mistake, but I found it to be remarkably accurate. But it's the fact that it just puts those um, captions directly on the screen straight away. No need to upload it somewhere to get it um, transcribed and then download it with the captions and, and all of that sort of thing. It's instantaneous. There's only one flaw with the Apple Clips app. Otherwise, I would probably use it almost exclusively. And it, that is that it only does square video. If it did portrait and if it did landscape as well, I think I would just use it almost exclusively. So Apple, I love the Clips app, but please give me portrait and give me landscape and then I'll be even happier. (laughs) Right. Well, listen, I may have a way to make you happier with regard to captioning and transcription. All right, go on then. I came across this wonderful um, application, best used on the laptop, I hasten to add, called Get Subly. Get as in the verb getting and subly S U B L Y. And get subly allows you to transcribe videos in any sizes you want, including landscape, which is usually my preferred format, but also they are pretty much able to do it in any common language around the world. So I did the test for you, Roger. I had a long form video, just really a one hour interview in English, and I had a half hour interview in French, and I got some pretty, pretty close results with that. As you mentioned a moment ago, you can go in and edit, and because you're using your laptop primarily, the editing is very, very fast. You have the kind of editor with the timestamps, so you you have little fields, and so on and so forth. And then you end up in a situation where you literally listen to the video, you kind of scroll through the edit, and even so often the odd word that may be misunderstood or that is very similar to a different one, you can correct. Once you're happy with the with the edit, you get that gets repurposed, and you have two options: you can download this famous SRT file. 
acronyms that I always forget what it means, but you know, the, the fun that you can then re upload on places like YouTube and Vimeo and many more to get the subtitles to appear at the right time. Or you can create a video where the transcription is literally embedded, if you will, or burnt into the video file as well. So I've done a bit of both, and Get Subly only this week celebrated their first one year anniversary. So they turned one year uh, a moment ago. I got a lovely newsletter from the managing director. Thank you for the support and so on. And they're going to make more and add new features and so on. So um, like I said, it's not the perfect solution. And I know that you can do something very similar on YouTube directly with regard to captioning. But if it can ever you know, be of help for your Rod's vlog or for anything that you do out there, I would definitely try Get Subly. Yep, going to try that. The next one, which is, um, I suppose, again, you and I don't talk to each other, but it's relating to content uh, production, is something that I rediscovered. So, uh, I tend not to forget more than I remember about those apps that you <laughs> and I discover. And I rediscovered Screencastify. So as you know, when you do an app, you have to have a fancy name or some fancy spelling. But Screencastify, as the name may suggest, allows you to record your laptop screen and record your voice and your webcam at the same time should you choose to do so. So then you can do some tutorials. You can obviously do some um, tour of you know your platform. Do you know some of those questions sometimes you get, Roger, about how did you do that? And you end yes. up having to write a lengthy email. But maybe what you could do is record a short video about how you did it, and people can see and hear your, your instructions. And then, if you want to, you can then upload this to Get Subly and then have transcriptions and captions in terms of that tutorial or kind of customer service call message, you know, with regard to subtitles. The good thing about Screencastify, which I know you and I have been researching, it does record in real HD, not ah. kind of fake HD or almost HD. It's Pretend <laughs> HD. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a recording. I sent it to uh, our video editor, Tim. I said, tell me whether or not it's worthy of my time. And he said, yes, that is great. So with Screencastify, Cast you get five minutes of recording free. If you want to go over five minutes, you have to pay, but the, the price plan is very, very modest. You know, it's not really extortionate cost. And it could be a wonderful companion for someone who is a content creator. Again, either because you do tutorials, you want to share your screen and explain how you do things, or simply a good customer service call. Fantastic. Do you know what? That sounds absolutely perfect. I think uh, the tech we've looked at today covers quite a lot of um, ground, especially in the creation of podcasts and video shows it does and that gives me thanks to that gives me a wonderful segue to the next thing i want to talk to you about which is this week in history In 1752, Benjamin Franklin flew his kite and key to capture ambient electric charge and thus make the connection between lightning and electricity. You're going to love this one, Roger. In June 1887, US inventor Herman Hollerith uh, submitted a patent for his punch card reading machine. Fast forward to 1924, his company and others merged and later became IBM. Oh, fantastic. And do you know what? 72 years ago, 21st of June 1948, the first program on the world's first stored program computer was run. 52 minutes to perform 3.5 million operations. It took place here in the UK, Manchester, built by Frederick Williams, Tom Kilburn and Jeff Tootill. Do you know, so much happened in the UK and in the world of um, programming, computing, and, and marketing. But 40 years ago, I'm going to take you back to your mem down memory lane. The first two video games to be registered for the US Copyright Office were the Ataris, Asteroids, and Lunar Landing. <laughs> I can remember playing those. And, and, and also, in 1979, 41 years ago, Microsoft introduced BASIC for their original 8086 computers. And I can remember playing on computers at school and actually having to load BASIC with a tape cassette. Well, let's continue with Microsoft. I've got two news for you all from this week in history. 22 years ago, Microsoft released Office 98. Can you believe it? Wow. It was wow. the big thing with the slogan, if you remember, works better, plays better. 
how things have moved on. And 14 years ago, on the 15th of June 2006, that's when Bill Gates announced he would transition away from the day-to-day -day running of Microsoft, as you may remember, to concentrate on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Do you know it's scary some of these some of these dates, Pascal? I think I tweeted out this week, and this is relating to films, but it makes the point. I, I I get quite frightened to find that some films that I regard as recent films, I'll I'll go into um, Google to look them up and 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 discover that some of them are twenty years old. You know, we were watching Gladiator the other night, and I and I consider that to be a recent film, and it was made in the year two thousand. And and when you see these dates in history and these references to Microsoft, God, you realise how quickly time flies. Indeed, and. For our viewers and listeners, this is why you and, I, you and I wanted to have this little segment, which is just to kind of recapture again and have a sense of history, a sense of trajectory. Because think about it, you know, this punch card reading machine from 1887 probably led to the computers of today and many other things. But the one I wanted to expand upon, I hope you don't mind, Roger, is those mm -hmm. two video games. The reason why is they were the first to be registered with the US Copyright Office, which I think may have been the precursor or the kind of gaming industry we know of today, but also the fact that those two games, Asteroids and Lunar Lander, not landing as I said a moment ago, I was terrible at. <laughs> when my preferred video games tend to be the kind of RPG adventure led where I can take my time to admire the landscape. I, I was try I try once to play online this kind of um you know what you call the Metal Gear Solid or or the form of um, kind of uh, army type things. I'm so busy admiring the graphics of the landscape that I get shot at by you know people all the time. <laughs> but you're the opposite because you've done rather well on Fortnite, I hear. Well, I started playing Fortnite recently and. Uh... It's in, it's immersive. It's addictive. Um, you know, it, it probably came around at the right time because of the lockdown. Because it's been a, it's it's been quite therapeutic. It's taken my mind off things. I, I I've always been a video gamer, Pascal, and and it, it, it you know, asteroids. Probably not one of my favourite games, actually. I was okay at Asteroids if I could stay in the middle of the screen just rotating round. But I always remember if I ever hit thrust and started moving, <laughs> that's when I just totally lost control of the ship and I would end up crashing. Uh, Lunar Lander loved it. But 1980, though, that, was a big, that was a big year for me. I, I, was, I, brought, I was brought up in Blackpool in the north of England with the Piers, and the Piers had loads and loads of video slot machine games mm. uh, like Lunar Lander, like like asteroids, and I must have spent a fortune shoveling 10p pieces into those video games on those piers in Blackpool back in the 80s. Well, the 80s for me were spent in France, as, as you can imagine, and oddly, we're more into pinball machines. Ah. And, uh, you know, that, um, whatever you call it, the foosball, you know, where we're playing with... Um, but the video games appeared, and there was one which I tried, and I was hopeless, called 1941, I think, where you were essentially flying an aircraft and shooting lots of aircraft. And then if you kind of passed a particular chapter, your aircraft would get bigger, you have more guns and so on, and you'll take on this kind of flying fortress. And then if you remember vaguely... Uh, so that was the game that I tried and spent an absolute fortune. And I was thinking about, for example, now, you know, with the, the, the releases of PS4 games, we heard PS5s coming soon as well, Xbox and so on. A good game now is about 50 to 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. And at first you kind of bulk and go, hang on a minute, this is asking a lot. But actually, I reckon I spent a lot more than that back in the days trying to complete Ghost and Goblins or Double Dragon. Oh, absolutely. And it was always, Mum, can I have a quid to go down to the pier? Yeah, okay, <laughs> off you go. And then, you know, ten that's ten, 10 games, you know, ten, 10 times 10. Uh, and I'd be back home <laughs> half an hour, an hour later. Mum, can I have another pound? <laughs> Did you ever complete it? I mean, I remember playing... Um, so I tried uh, Space Invaders, you know, played that a lot. And do you play Hopper when you used to play the frog that had to go across the road? That was never a favourite of mine. Um, I was very much into the shooting games. The, the one that I remember with so much affection is a game called Defender. Uh, and again, that came out around about 1980. Uh, it was probably one of the first... Uh, video games that had colour in it but the thing about Defender it, it was basically a shooting game you, you had a little fighter that flew across the surface of a, of a mm. planet and you had to defend these humanoids from being picked up by landers um, but it was totally random 
There was nothing. I mean, with Space Invaders and to a certain extent Lunar Lander and those, you could almost learn where to be at a certain time to to win whereas defender was totally random every game was different you know the first time i put 10p into a defender machine i think the game was over within 10 seconds and it also had an up and down um uh knob it had about five different buttons to press hyperspace smart bomb direction change and all of this sort of thing and it was one of those games that a lot of people would have thought, no, nah, this is far too hard. But after shoveling about 500 quid into the machine <laughs> over the course of a year, I became actually quite good at it. And because it was totally random and open-ended, you could come in one day and have a game which might have lasted 30 minutes and you'd gather a great big audience of people watching you. And then the following day, you could come in 10p and your game's over within 20 seconds. Incredible game. Even by today's standards, I think Defender is one of the all-time greatest video games you know that image of um, you with your mate surrounding you as you're doing well it's not essentially what's happening nowadays with esports where i mean yeah. i know that for some generation it's puzzling to think of people who watch others play video games but in a way that's what we did and you know for me it's kind of interesting because the video games, indeed, you know, cinema, which we'll we'll talk about in, in a moment, there is an element of social interaction, which at the moment is very limited. And and I wonder whether that's what we try and do. We may have an occupation, as in playing a video game on your own at home, but there's still that temptation to have a, a form of a gathering, whether you play with others online, whether you take part in something like Fortnite, which has some element of collaboration, or indeed um, the live streamers who would play whilst discussing and having interaction with others. So it's just fascinating to observe. And, and again, for you and I, we have this great belief that if you look at gaming, film production, TV production, and communication in, in the business sense, we can learn an enormous amount. Absolutely. You look at some of these streamers. I mean, I, I've, I've been consuming a few Fortnite videos recently, and some of these video streamers have got 5 million subscribers on YouTube. 5 million subscribers. And, you know, you'll get some marketing people giving out tips. You know, your videos only have got to be less than three minutes long, otherwise <laughs> nobody will watch them. Come on. If the content is interesting to a specific target audience, people will watch it, and 5 million people will subscribe to you. The key is always to find the audience and to find the content that is standout to that particular audience. That's perfect. And you know what? Once again, that gives me a wonderful segue for our next element, which is our creator's shout-outs. The first one I want to talk about this week, Pascal, is our good friend, Mr. Mark Asquith. I think he describes himself as that British podcasting guy That's or right, something yes. like that. Uh, he's, um, he's, all, he's also the, uh, the guy who created uh, Captivate FM, which is the uh, podcasting syndication platform that the audio version of this podcast sits on. And... He's, he's, he speaks on stages around the world at podcasting conferences. Mark has recently spent quite a lot of time uh, investing in video equipment, and he's just launched a video version of his podcast. And, and the latest version is how to make money from podcasting. Now, quite a lot of people do podcasting because they love it. They do it as a hobby, but it's a seriously good way of making money. And Mark is one of the leading podcast expert so you can learn a lot from this video and, and i think it's a wonderful addition to the youtube community uh, as much mm. as he describes himself as the british podcast that british podcast guy for me uh when i heard the news they was going to uh, be a video as well and do video podcasting i thought it was a joyous moment yeah yeah and our second, our second is Mr. Ian Anderson Gray, not to be confused with the lead singer of Jethro Tull, which I always tend to do. <laughs> That's Ian Anderson. Ian Anderson Gray, he, he's been around in the digital marketing space for a very long time. In fact, Ian Anderson Gray, funnily enough, was one of the first people I met in this part, in, in this part of the industry. I think we were together within the social media examiner forums back in the back in the uh, uh, 
2010s. And Ian started a podcast a year ago. It was called Confident Live, the Confident Live Marketing Podcast. And it's all about how to utilize live video to promote your personal brand. Now, I was very fortunate to go on that. I can't remember which episode it was, episode 38, I think. And recently, Ian did his first anniversary edition, which was quite an ambitious three-hour production. I think he, he streamed it over something like StreamYard or, or Restream, and he invited as many of the guests that he'd hosted over the first year back on the show, and we were all popping in for five, ten minutes each, having a bit of banter, answering a few questions, and then the next guest would come along. Now, to be perfectly honest, the logistical nightmare of doing something like that fills me with dread, but Ian pulled it off with absolute aplomb, so hats off. It's very entertaining. Ian's a very, very enthusiastic host anyway, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. Oh, please do. And is he still doing this this thing where he has a, a he sings a song at the beginning of uh, of of his uh, podcast for each guest? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, my episode, as you would expect, was was talking about keeping marketing simple, and he created this sort of rock track. Uh, so it had heavy guitars in the background, sort of going da 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 da, da. And, and then you've got Ian's voice going, "Keep it, keep it, keep it simple, keep it, keep it, keep it simple." You know, so it's it's uh, it's fab, it's fab. Well, when we spoke earlier, so I'm laughing thinking about this idea of of hearing that song because actually I heard it uh, on the podcast. But we talked about finding your voice. I think Ian has done that. It's been really quite something to see uh, his evolution and his journey as a uh, content creator. And yeah, well done. One year anniversary with all the work that goes behind the scenes to create his um, his live shows. Um, well done, Ian. So here's another one I want to give a shout out to. Um, Amy Woods. Amy, the queen of content repurposing and the founder and driving force of Content 10X. She recently published an article that I thought was just on the money. It's called How to Segment Your Content for ultimate repurposing, brackets, learning from TV shows. Now, you know that makes complete sense because TV shows, radio shows indeed, they have this great way of segmenting. You and I are learning and are picking up, you know, obviously, hence for our own show. But the way she's gone about it, both, it's a long-form article. You know, I like long-form. I like people to go detailed and in-depth. But what she's saying makes complete sense. And importantly, she's also practicing what she's preaching and you can see that through the podcasting through the videos and so on so amy keep up the good work but well done with this article we might even do a more of a deep dive in in a future episode and finally i wanted to celebrate someone who just recently launched their very first podcast series you may remember fondly what it was like for you when you began roger uh, I like new beginnings. I, I like a new website. I like a new podcast series. So David Charlton, he's a man who is essentially a, on a mission to help people understand what he call mental toughness. And mm-hmm. he's bringing mm-hmm. the world of sport into the world of business. He's looking at athletes. He's looking at particularly high-profile kind of um, personalities in the world of sport, how they've acquired and learned about mental toughness to go through challenges, sometimes physical, sometimes psychological, and he's bringing that into the world of business for leaders and owners. And of course, he's chosen this moment in time, the pandemic, to say to people, you are perhaps better equipped than you think to deal with this. You just need to tap into your mental toughness. So he launched his podcast about a week ago now. And I wanted to kind of say well done to him because New Beginnings, again, are both exciting but very challenging. Do you remember what it was like for you when you launched your marketing and finance podcast? Uh, ab- absolutely. I mean, there was always that, what on earth do you think you're doing here? So there was, there's that imposter syndrome thing setting in, isn't there? Uh, it's just a, a question of if you if you have that belief and you can create the discipline and the consistency and, and, and like we've alluded to earlier on, you identify your audience and you give them something different, then eventually you're going to get that traction and you're going to grow. Uh, but yeah, at the start, it's, it's almost like standing at the foot of Everest. Absolutely. So Mark Asquith, Ian Anderson Gray, Amy Woods and David Charlton, we salute you. So, Roger, this is film marketing, our last segment. 
we want to talk today about Disney+. Plus. The 24th of March is an important date, Roger. To begin with, it's my dad's birthday. It was the day we started lockdown in the UK, but it was also the day Disney Plus was launched in the UK. Now, we knew about it, and I was one of many that actually registered early. So, not because of the discount, but I was so excited. When you look at the catalogue of movies from the, the, the back catalogue of all the Disney classics, but the whole Marvel uh, kind of uh, movies, and, and so on and so forth, and of course Star Wars, including The Mandalorian, I was generally very excited to have a new streaming service to go alongside Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime and many others and Bridbox for us in the UK as well. And I'm going to say to you, Roger, I was really, really disappointed and I felt almost, almost ignore the letdown but a real lack of marketing campaign and engagement that came with the launch. I mean, don't get me wrong, we had the, the TV kind of adverts and trailer but that was the same as in the US. I did get my newsletter telling me that cinema was happening but very very quickly it was kind of it has happened and there was just no follow-up there was no sense of celebration of engagement with the audience i was thinking roger you know where was the live sessions on social media where were the giveaways for those who like me who went early and registered where were the specials that they could have announced and so on and more importantly at this moment in time we were three months after the launch give or take roger I get the newsletter and it just tells me essentially vaguely what is new. It's not even personalized to my taste in the Marvel, the Star Wars and the Mandalorian. And I'm just wondering, Roger, why is there such a lack of commitment to communicating with their audience? Is it because they think they are Disney and they don't need to? Is it because they don't know what to make actually of this very rich and diverse range of movies? I just wanted to have fun with the team at Disney, the same way I feel I can have fun with other brands. And it just did not happen. It, 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 it's perplexing, isn't it? It's absolutely perplexing. They, uh, I mean, I'd like to think that it isn't because they're just Disney uh, and that that they think that their, their brand speaks on its own. I mean, these days, uh, we've already said in this podcast, we're awash with content. You have to make your stuff stand out. And yes, Star Wars stands out. The Avengers stand out. But I think people still need to be reminded because they've also got to compete with Netflix and Amazon and BBC and Sky and all of that sort of thing. So I, I just don't get why they weren't using their emails more effectively, why they weren't creating a buzz and an excitement around it. I mean, the fact that they the fact that they launched three months, four months, however long it was, in the UK after they'd launched in the States, again, I, I I'm not quite I don't quite get that. I mean, if you're really into a, t a TV series, or you're really into a brand. You don't like it when other parts of the world get it first. Um, I mean, the last series of Game of Thrones, we knew that the uh, that the Americans were getting it the day before we got it in the UK. So a lot of us were staying up until the time it was shown in the States so that we could watch it on, on our Sky TVs. So, I mean, let's face it, I'm not condoning any of this, but people who wanted to watch The Mandalorian weren't going to wait three months for it to be launched in the UK. They would have some way of getting to see it when they when when it was launched in America, whether somebody recorded it and sent them a, a an MP4 or whatever. You know, I'm not condoning piracy in any way, shape or form, but these things happen. You know, why not just do a global, absolute mega launch? And and really, The Mandalorian, Pascal, I I actually thought The Mandalorian series was better than the final Star Wars film. I enjoyed it more than the final Star Wars film. So I think they could have built a much more mightier campaign around launching Disney Plus across the world simultaneously, rather than a big bang in the States followed by a damp squib in the UK. I would agree, and I would agree, by the way, with your comment about Mandalorian being better than the last Star Wars. Um, something that we may explore again, uh, but you know, mm. to the fact that we have nine, we have now nine Star Wars movies, and a good two thirds are not obviously hitting the mark, particularly the, the the last three, in my view. But um, for me, it's about lessons. So, film marketing as a segment for our video 
podcast is about lessons and I'm wondering whether we need to ever ever be reminded that just because you are established just because you have that relationship with customers you shouldn't forget that engagement and retention is also part of what you need to do not just recruiting new customers and I think there was some element of that in the article that I picked from the um, showrunners.com you know about commodity content for me it's just this idea of there was a real opportunity here to create a sense of celebration and a sense of event, really, because I can't recall the dates, but we would have been obviously a few months after the launch of Galaxy's Edge at the um, Disney Park. So actually, you've, you've got all that going on. I mean, if you look at StarWars.com, which is the dedicated channel, uh, both online and, and obviously through normal TV channels, for news about Star Wars, they know how to celebrate. They understand mm. how to get the audience engaged. And, and for me, it's just this idea of, surely somebody at Disney Plus must be as excited as we are to be working there, and they should feel compelled to share that news. And unless I've missed it, which is possible, Roger, I just don't see that those in charge of marketing and engagement are putting the effort in. Is it because they're nervous, again, about, you know, uh, rustling some favours? I don't know. But ultimately, you are taking on Netflix and Amazon Prime. You're doing it. And I don't think it should just be on price because, you know, their monthly fee is lower than the other uh, services. I don't think this is how you should compete. You should compete on the fact that actually... By being a member, I'm going to use that term, Roger, by being a member of Disney+, Plus, because this is how I want to feel about it, the same way I might with other channels, I want to feel looked after. And to receive the same email newsletter as everybody else already suggests to me that they're just not thinking about it. I think you're right. And, you know, Netflix, I, mean, I, I sometimes think that Netflix communications can get a little bit intrusive they do send out lots of emails for example uh, i started watching a new series on netflix the other day called the order um, it wasn't the best series i've ever seen and i think we watched the first episode and then a few days went by and i got an email saying you should watch episode two of the order now on the one hand i thought well, that's that's really that's really quite clever isn't it um you know they're giving me a bit of a nudge there that's good but then on the other side of the coin i'm thinking mm, is that a little bit too intrusive i don't like intrusive marketing but let's stick with the clever bit but you're not getting anything like that from disney plus that the, there's not that engagement as you say it's very very generic and and for such a big brand with such a sort of history of incredible content that I just can't help think that they've missed a trick here. Completely. So listen, our criticism is born out of actually love for the world yes, of cinema. Yes, yes. And, and it's just saying that, once again, it's a bit like, you know, forgive me to use uh, your comment earlier, that like the last Star Wars film, there was a missed opportunity. It's been missed. They've missed it. So now, over to them to do something special, maybe uh, for the six-month anniversary or the one-year anniversary. I don't think they should wait too long. But make us feel as though we belong to something unique and special because, ultimately, that's how I feel. And at this moment in time, I feel just a little neglected and short-changed by a brand that should really take over because they are the number one brand when it comes to entertainment and storytelling. Yeah, and, and more Mandalorian, please, like ASAP. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, this has been episode one. This has been immense fun, Roger. Yes, absolutely right. I mean, we really got into those content uh, pieces, didn't we? You know, we've been saying for years, Pascal, that we should record a video of ourselves having a glass of wine and talking about marketing topics. And, and admittedly, this is early in the morning, so I thought the glass of wine wasn't appropriate. But I think we finally got there. We finally got there. And, you know, I'm looking quickly at the list of things that we've covered. There's an enormous amount here. And we would love for all of you to give us feedback and suggestions in the usual places about how we can further improve our role, our ambition is to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech content, and wisdom from the world of marketing. We're going to say goodbye. He was Roger Edwards. I was Pascal Fintoni. Go out there and make some amazing marketing. Thank you.